All right, as uh, I hinted at in the prayer, we're going to continue with our Ryrie Lecture Series today. It is the final day of the lecture series, so I encourage again, uh, pay attention, take notes. We are doing Calvary Questions, so get on Twitter and hashtag Calvary Questions. And if you don't have Twitter, as usual, raise your hand, yell at me, get my attention somehow, and uh, I will I'll call on you when we get the chance. So if you will, welcome Dr. Ice for the final day of the Ryrie Lecture Series. Thank you, sir. Little children, it is the last hour. <laughs> That's a quasi-quote, I think, from the Bible. But uh, it's interesting when people start moving away from the literal or proper interpretation of Scripture, the two areas it most affects are creation and eschatology. Because these are the two areas that you have to trust God for. You have to take his word. And uh, so I'm going to start by dealing with a, a question that we had, and that is the use of symbols. Uh, but otherwise, we're going to talk about the millennium and the eternal state. And you have a, a number of symbols in the book of Revelation, for example. And these are some that Revelation tells you what they mean. And about half of the symbols Revelation tells you the seven stars are the uh, seven angels of the churches. Uh, seven lampstands, this is in chapter one, are the churches of Asia. It says that in the text. So uh, you don't have to hallucinate to try to figure it out. The seven lamps of fire are seven spirits. It tells you, I believe that's in chapter four. The bowls of incense are the prayers of the saints in chapter 7 that are dumped on there. The great multitude are those who came out of the great tribulation. Uh, and then the great dragon, it says, is the devil and Satan. This is the first place in Revelation 12 where it tells you uh, what the serpent in Genesis 3 refers to in a direct, plain way. Uh, and it repeats this in Revelation 19, by the way, or 20, I think. And the stars of heaven uh, in Revelation 12 are fallen angels because it states it in chapter 12, uh, the stars fall from heaven, and then it repeats that phrase later and calls them angels. And then you have the seven heads of the beast are the seven mountains, which refer to the seven kingdoms, and the ten horns of the beast are the ten kings uh, that are going to arise uh, to, to uh, form what we call the revived Roman Empire. And the waters, it says, are the people's multitude, nations, and tongues. And uh, the woman is the great city, um, and that is Babylon, for example, in Revelation 17. So the, it, it explains these symbols, but elsewhere it uses symbols that you can find somewhere else in Scripture. For example, Revelation 12:1, a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. And when you go to Genesis, there are 14 uh, dreams in the book of Genesis that use symbolic language. And so early in Genesis, uh, and each of these are dreams in pairs, and therefore you have symbols that are used that are clear. And so you have Genesis showing you in the uh, first book of the Bible how to interpret symbols. And you carry them over because it explains uh, for you in Genesis these symbols. But here it says, a great woman in 12.1, Revelation, appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. So there's one place in the Old Testament where that's described, and that's in Genesis chapter uh, 37. Uh, <clears throat> and it relates to the two, two dreams that Joseph had. And it says in verses 5 through 7, Then Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. And he said to them, Please listen to the dream which I have had. For behold, I was binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf rose up, 
and also stood erect. And behold, your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to my sheath. Just think, uh, those of you that have brothers and sisters, if one of your brothers and sisters came and told you that they were going to reign over you one day, how would you like that or t would you take that? I'm sure y'all had no brotherly or sisterly rivals among you growing up, but nevertheless, so try to understand uh, this passage here. Then his brothers and sisters said to him, are you actually going to reign over us? Or are you really going to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. So they understood the symbolism, you see. Uh, and then you had the second dream and it says, now he had still another dream. I'm sure they went whoopee, right? They were real excited about hearing the second dream and related it to his brothers and said, lo, I've had still another dream. And behold, the sun and the moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. Well, that sounds like, at least it's close, one star off, book of Revelation. And so clearly you, you have... Joseph getting involved at this point, his father, and he related it to his father and to his brothers. Did I say Joseph? His father? No. His father rebuked him and said to him, what is this dream that you have had? Shall I, and of course that refers to Jacob, he understood that the son referred to him, and your mother, which referred to Rachel, uh, the moon, and your brothers, are the stars actually come to bow ourselves down to the ground? And uh, the answer was yes, it could happen, and it did happen, as we know. So here, they uh, you have sun, moon, and stars, and it's related to uh, the nation of Israel. You see, it enables you to see how the Bible is using the symbolism that it draws from, in this case, Genesis and uses it in the book of Revelation. So every symbol's either explained in the text or uh, it's understood in a similar way as you look back through the scripture. And uh, Revelation assumes you know the rest of scripture because it has all, over 550 symbols, I'm sorry, figures of speech and uh, uh, re uh, references rather to the Old Testament. And so in our looking at the book of Revelation here, we're moving to uh, the millennium, and then we'll see the eternal state here as we progress on. And we look at Revelation 20, verse 1, it says, And I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key of the abyss, and a great chain in his hand. And so the millennium starts with an angel who's going to do what? To chain Satan. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan. And here's the second reference that we saw in chapter 12 just a moment ago and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he should not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed after these things he must be released for a short time and as we're going to see in a moment he's released and he like a magnet draws those who have become unbelievers during the millennium because during the millennium uh, believers are going to have children who survive the seventh uh, the tribulation period and go into the millennium in their mortal bodies while we will be there in our resurrected bodies in some way it's not real clear exactly where we'll be uh, etc but the millennium starts with Christ bringing the rebuilt the fourth temple you have the first two temples were destroyed uh, then you have the temple that's going to be rebuilt in the midpoint of the tribulation it's going to be destroyed we assume because of the topographical changes that will take place and the fourth temple a mile square which would not fit on the current temple mount will come down from heaven and uh, the Mount Temple Mount will become the highest place on planet Earth because from the tribulation, all the mountains have fallen down, etc. And so this becomes the highest place where the Lord himself will reign from for a thousand years, literally on planet Earth. And so you have Christ sitting on David's throne. Probably David is going to also be ruling over 
um, Israel. He's said to be the prince over Israel, but Christ will be ruling over the whole world from Israel, and the curse will be removed except for death. So it's totally rolled back. People are going to be able to live a thousand years. And then you have the millennial temple because there are still mortals, so you still have to approach God through holiness. And the atonement is not recapitulated, but when you look at the five uh, sacrifices that are talked about in Ezekiel in that temple, they are for the general cleansing of the temple and the temple ceremonies. And so, so you still have to, uh, those in their mortal bodies, approach God through holiness, and, and that is through Christ, of course. And you have the temple sacrifices, and then you have an end-time rebellion where Satan re leads a rebellion against them. And so, I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, judgment was given to them, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of the testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark upon their forehead and upon their hand, and they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. And six times a thousand years is used here in Revelation 20, and there's no reason to say that it doesn't mean a thousand years. It, it means a thousand years. In fact, in pre-Christian Judaism, people speculated before uh, Christ ever came on the scene how long the kingdom would be. And some speculated it would be a thousand years based on the what's called the septa millennial view, that six days, a uh, thousand years of history plus 1,000 uh, although some speculated it would be 10,000 and other things, but I'm just saying there are people, Jewish people, who speculated the kingdom would be a 1,000 years before it was actually revealed in the book of Revelation. And so we, we see then where <clears throat> five, verses 5 and 6 says, The rest of the dead did not come to life until the 1,000 years were completed. See, God is going to collect all the unbelievers and then he's going to have a single judgment for them before they transition into the eternal state. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Uh, over these, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. And so, just as Christ was humiliated through the his death, burial, and resurrection, at, resurrection wasn't humiliation, but on planet earth, in, as he rose in victory, he is going to reign and rule literally on planet earth. And this is one of the reasons as a premillennialist we believe that uh, Christ has to actually reign and rule because he is the hero of history. And he is going to actually reign and rule because he is the focus of history. Jesus is the hero of history. And that's why you have to have a literal thousand years on planet Earth for him to overcome and uh, demonstrate uh, what the creation of mankind was to be like as the God-man. And so then we see at the end of the thousand years when they are completed, Satan will be released from the, his prison. And that's so he's put down in the abuso, as the Greek calls it, the abyss, uh, because he has another role in history. So he's going to be released from his prison. The false prophet and the beast are cast into the lake of fire because they're finished in history before the millennium begins. And he will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog. And I think the phrase Gog and Magog here is uh, referring back to the great invasion that takes place uh, early on in the tribulation or actually before the tribulation but after the rapture in which they attack Israel. And so it's kind of like saying, uh, you know, the battle of Waterloo and we use that phrase saying, you know, to someone on an individual basis, you met your Waterloo, you know, when I took calculus or something like that. Uh, of course, I... I never even got close to calculus myself, but I've heard that could be a lot of people's Waterloo. 
And so Gog and Magog to gather them together for the war, the number of them is like the sand of the seashore. So these are the descendants of believers whose children, some, many will become believers, but many will not. But because Christ is reigning, he's a dictator, reigning on the throne, they're not going to rebel. But Satan somehow has the ability to, like a magnet, attract all the unbelievers and to rally them uh, in rebellion against God. And this is what they do. And so uh, it says that they came out on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city, and, they came, and fire came down from heaven and devoured them. So uh, instead of taking seven years... God makes a quick end to them, and they are judged there in that way. And then the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. You know, and there, there's no way to get out of the fact that, that hell is forever, and here it's same language is used for human beings later, but it's the consequences of a person's decision to not accept Christ as their Savior. And it's real. And Satan is the third person cast into it. And I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away because of God's holiness and righteousness. And no place was found for them. In other words, you, you can't escape God's presence. Uh, you know, when the great white throne judgment comes, you're not going to be able to hire the dream team as lawyers to defend you. It, it, you're going to have to appear there yourself. The dream team's probably going to have a few problems of their own. But nevertheless, I guess y'all are, do they know the O.J. Simpson trial? Are y'all too young to know that? Okay, I, I didn't know. You know, I use these, some of these things that are, okay. Uh, and in verse 12, it says, And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. And books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things that were written in the books according to their deeds. So if you reject Christ, then you're saying, I want to be judged according to my own deeds. And the Bible says that your righteousness is as filthy rags in the sight of God. So you're going to get your opportunity. And the book, singular, is the book of life. Your name's not written there. And so then you're judged according to the books, the records that God has of every deed that every unbeliever does. Now, believers will not be there except perhaps as uh, per, uh spectators and so we will not have to appear because Christ has paid for our sins and we will not have to appear at this great white throne judgment and the sea gave up the dead which were in it and the death and Hades gave up the dead which are in them and they were judged every one of them according to their deeds I don't know how long it's going to take uh, you know if it's going to be one by one, I just don't know, but it's going to happen in some tangible, physical, actual way in the future. And then it says, and death and Hades, in other words, unbelievers, were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And this is a geographical location that's real. Uh, separated from God. Some people say, well, hell is just separation from God. Well, it's, it is separation from God, but it's, it's also, you know, described clearly in this way in the Bible. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book, he was thrown into the lake of fire. You know, we have that instance in Luke's gospel about the rich man and Lazarus. And he was in the, the, the he's not in the lake of fire, but he's in a place similar to it. And, uh, he, it seemed very real to him. And so the book of life, if your name's not written there, you will then be evaluated based on your works and cast into the lake of fire. That ends history. So 
God waits till the end of history to judge all unbelievers from Genesis on through the end of history. So the next phase in the book of Revelation is the eternal state, and that is recorded in chapters 21 and 22. And we see what goes beyond the present heaven and present earth because at the end of the great white throne judgment, a new heaven and a new earth, it says in 21, 1 and 2, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. So that means the universe is going to be totally destroyed. Now, some people say it's going to be renovated. I, I think the language means it's going to be totally destroyed. And part of the reason is because this current universe is tainted by sin. And some people say it's going to, the present uh, heaven and earth is just going to be remodeled. Well, the remodeling took place at the flood, so to speak. The total destruction and recreation, I believe, of the new heavens and new earth is in the future. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. See, God built into creation ahead of time things that are going to help him reveal himself. And the sea, according to Scripture in the book of Daniel, represents the Gentile masses of humanity in rebellion against God. The wind blows them, and uh, the water can be very dangerous, as if you read the news, the hurricanes, and all this kind of stuff. So there's no sea. Uh, there's water. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for a husband. Now, that language means, uh, when does a woman look her prettiest? Well, at least theoretically at her, on her wedding day because they spend a lot of time and effort and money uh, to look pretty. And so this is a, a metaphorical way of saying that this is going to be even greater than the present heavens and earth. It's going to be, it's going to blow your mind. If you think this present earth and heaven is amazing, wait till you see the new one. It's going to be God's best effort. And we see here in verse 3, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. In other words, God's going to hang out with humanity. Uh, and he shall dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be among them. Now, a, a lot of people think, well, you know, it's going to be boring sitting around talking to God all this time, you know. Well, I don't think so. Don't forget you're going to have a new resurrection body. And you will not have those sinful, shall I say, negative thoughts about God that may come into your mind. This is going to be amazing. I think in that uh, idiom today, amazing. And he shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. Uh, in other words, no one will be able to hurt you with what they say and there shall no longer be any death there shall no longer be any mourning or any or crying or pain for the first things had passed away that's part of the old world we're not going to ever be sad or cry or be upset anymore in this new creation and in our new bodies and it says he who sits on the throne, says, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. And so we then see, he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of water of life without cost. And we're going to see this is how the book of Revelation ends with a comment to that. One who thirsts means you see your need as a sinner for God's solution, for the, the, the living water that quenches your thirst. And that is an emphasis not just of taking away your sin, but of giving you meaning and purpose in life because you now are able to know why God created you. And it gives you direction and purpose and fulfillment 
is, is the picture and ideal here, just like the water does to a thirsty person. He who overcomes, and by the way, all believers are overcomers because of what Christ has done, shall inherit these things, and I will be his God, and they will be my son. So each individual in some way is going to have a direct personal relationship with, with Christ as uh, someone's a father to a son in, in that kind of relationship. And it says, verse 8, but for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake of fire that burns with fire and brimstone, uh, which is the second death. And it's made it pretty clear <laughs> that is the destiny of unbelievers. And uh, it's solely based upon whether you've trusted Christ or not. And one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I shall show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And here, this is personified as the new Jerusalem, you know, that, that comes down from heaven. He carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. And having the glory of God, her brilliance was like a very costly stone as a stone of crystal clear jasper. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not up on all of these minerals and things. <laughs> so uh, I, I, would, I would have to look all of this stuff up, but they're very valuable, amazing uh, way of looking at things. It had a great and high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates, 12 angels, and names were written on them, which are those of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. And so the names indicate who lives there, right? And those who are, are spiritual, in this case, descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the spiritual descendants as well. And uh, it goes on and describes the place. There were three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. Uh, I guess easy entry, I don't know. It's kind of like the 12 tribes, though, in the Old Testament. And the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So you have Israel and the church, you know, the redeemed of the ages uh, in some way related to this. And the one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city and its gates and its walls. So this is going to be a f actual physical place with actual physicality. And the city is laid out as a square, and its length is as great as the width. And he measured the city with the rod, 1,500 miles. Its length and width and height are equal. And so it kind of uh, comes down from heaven, 72 yards according to... Uh, human measurements, the wall, the height of the wall, uh, which also are angelic measurements. It, and, and that's something good to know, that human uh, measurements are the same as angelic measurements. How many of you all have wondered that your whole life? But he, here it lets you know that. And the material of the wall was jasper, and the city was pure gold, like clear glass. So it's some kind of transparent gold. And so this is what it would look like if it were overlaying the United States, 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles, something like that. <clears throat> and then we see the 12 gates were 12 uh, pearls. So you can imagine a, a single pearl being these large gates. And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. You know, uh, when I came from my office this morning the men were working they're going to repave that area over there and I thought what would it cost to pave this parking lot with gold I mean just that little parking lot would, would bankrupt about everything you could think of if it was paved with gold right it's about 12 35 an ounce right now, $1,235 an ounce. How deep would you, how thick would you make it? You know, and all of that. And this is going to be everywhere. And so gold is going to be like pavement in a sense. In fact, the 
I heard a story once of uh, a lawyer who died and went to heaven. And, uh, you know, they say there's not many lawyers that are saved. That's what they say. If you want to get mad, get mad at them. <laughs> and he gets there and he brought a briefcase with him. And the worker angels were in processing him. And they were, uh, they said, how come he gets to bring a briefcase in? They said, well, we don't get many lawyers up here. So uh, he worked out a special deal and he gets to bring a briefcase from earth there. And so the worker angels opened up the briefcase and it had gold bars in it. And the, one angel said to the other, why would anybody want to bring pavement up here? You know? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so the point is, is it, it's going to be amazing. Uh, then we see, I saw no temple in it for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are his, its temple. Now, this is instructive because the temple, the tabernacle and the temple in the Old Testament was a place that protected the holiness of God because God can't, because of his holiness, dwell, that is, have fellowship with people just anywhere. And so the temple, first the tabernacle, then the temple, was built as a clean room, so to speak, uh, that did not have ceremonial contamination where people could meet God. And so you have a temple in the millennium because there's still fallen people there to interact with God in that way. But in the, in the new heavens and new earth where you have a total separation between believers and unbelievers and the new creation is not polluted with sin, there's no need for a temple. God is everywhere. God and his holiness is everywhere. And so that's the idea here is... Uh, no temple in it for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. In other words, uh, you're going to be able to have direct fellowship with God constantly. And the city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine upon it, for the glory of God has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. So the Shekinah glory, as we call it, as the Jews have uh, called it, is going to provide the light and uh, you know, this also probably speaks to the issue of why there was light, separation between light and day in the original creation for the first three days before the sun was created on the fourth day, is God didn't need a sun to provide light. He is light. But uh, for the creation on the fourth day, he created the light. But there's, we're not going to have a need for that in the new creation. And the nations shall walk by its light, and the kings of the earth shall bring their glory into it. And so everything we do, apparently, you know, we're going to be phys just as physical, but a new body. And uh, we will be involved in doing things of learning. We won't just sit around singing songs. Um, and things like that. But apparently we'll be doing things and nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth shall bring their glory into it uh, to honor God. And in the daytime, for there shall be no night there, its gates shall never be closed. And uh, so uh, we will not have to sleep like we do today. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. I think I already said that. And nothing unclean and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. In other words, it's going to totally forever separate believer and unbeliever. And we know where the unbelievers are going to be located and believers will be there and there will be no threat. In other words, you cannot sin again once you are resurrected. Isn't that great? Not even I will be able to sin. A great sinner such as I. And you won't be able to sin uh, because we have already been tested through the events that uh, history has put us through already at this point. And he showed me a river of the water of life. No sea but there is the river of life coming down, crystal 
clear as crystal coming from the throne of God and the lamb in the middle of its street. So this is apparently this mountain, this high, high area, and, and, a, and a single stream of water comes down. And on either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Now, I don't know how that relates. Uh, you know, we're going to live forever, but apparently as de we're still dependent creatures on God. And to today we show our dependence by having to eat and sleep. Um, they say, I don't know, somebody probably here knows, if you stay up without sleep, a certain number of days you'll die. Sure, it varies from individual to individual. But uh, here, I, I don't recommend you try that. And some of you think, well, I, I've already done that with my school. I've stayed up late and all of that. Uh, yes, you have. Uh, <clears throat> I stayed up late when I was a student, and look, look what happened to me. So I, I don't, <laughs> don't really recommend it. But apparently, even though we have eternal life, we're still dependent on God, you see? And apparently this relates in that way of some kind of dependency on God that we still will eat and uh, of these fruits and the leaves are for the healing of the nations, even though we're not gonna get sick. <laughs> and there shall no longer be any curse, Genesis 3, and the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it and his bondservants shall serve him. That's us, believers. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. Remember Moses wanted to see the face of God, and God wouldn't let him? He knew he, he, he couldn't handle it. So he put him in the cleft of a rock, and he passed by, and he saw a sh the shadow of his backside. And he glowed for uh, apparently a long time after that, just seeing the shadow of the backside of God. But just think, in eternity, we're going to be able to look into the face. And this is the picture of actually knowing a person one-on-one, -on -one, getting to know them, to look into the face. I'm told that every face in the history of the world is different from any other face. Some of our faces are more different than others, but nevertheless, this relates to the fact of knowing specifically a specific person, and in this case, God. We're gonna get to know him personally in, in this way. And so that, that's amazing. And it says in verse five, and there shall no longer be any night, and uh, no longer any need of the light of lamp or the light of the sun because the Lord God shall illumine them and they shall reign forever and ever. That's the same language. If you're going to say hell isn't forever, then heaven's not forever. Same exact language that was used earlier there. And he said to me, these words are faithful and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets sent his angel to show to his bond servants the things which must shortly take place. And as we've said, this idea of engage shortly means suddenly take place. And they're going to, we're looking forward to it. And behold, uh, behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. And that's why you're to always be ready uh, because he could come at any moment in the rapture. And I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel. And this is a common thing that you see throughout Scripture, people worshiping angels. Uh, by the way, if an angel ever appears to you, uh, uh, the, the angels always say, don't worship me, worship God. And he said to me, do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and your brethren and the prophets and of those who heed the words of this book, worship God. Uh, and he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book for the time is near. Now in the book of Daniel, it says to seal them up. The, it, they've got to be preserved for the Jewish nation 
during, starting in the time of the tribulation. I don't have time to get into that, but basically that's the deal. Whereas the book of Revelation is not to be, and it doesn't mean you cannot understand the book of Daniel until the end times. It's not saying that. It's just saying that these are, have to be preserved. And, and when you look at the history of the Jewish people, they haven't studied much the book of Daniel. Uh, and so they are going to study, they're going to wake up and study it during the tribulation, and it's going to help lead to their conversion. But the book of Revelation is not to be sealed. In other words, uh, you need to learn it because it could happen at any moment. You see what I'm saying? And that's the, the whole idea. The time is near. It's in case it's at hand. Uh, let the one who does wrong still do wrong, and let the one who is filthy still be filthy, and let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness, and let the one who is holy still keep himself holy. And uh, so we see there's that statement in Daniel about concealing up uh, the books and about how Daniel could not understand, and uh, I already explained that to some degree. Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. This idea of quickness, you know, it's, it's been 2,000 years, I know, but he's, his point is on suddenness at any moment. You don't know. Always be prepared as if he, could, as if he is coming in the next moment. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. There's, he, he's everything. That's why your priorities need to be focused on him, the creator. Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may uh, have right to the tree of life. In other words, blessed are those who become believers, if you're a believer, uh, and may enter by the gates into the city. The tree of life was forbidden for Adam and Eve. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And so he associates with the Old Testament. And the spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears come. So he's inviting us. The, the Holy Spirit and the church are telling people to come to Christ, who hears and says, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. In other words, a person who recognizes their need. Let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. And so we see in uh, verses 18 19, I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God shall add to him the plagues which are written in the book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city which are written in the book. Don't mess with the book of Revelation. <laughs> and the final verse, verses say, he who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. So we have a great future to look forward to. And we have 60, 70, 80 years here on planet Earth. And you won't regret living for Christ for the rest of eternity. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word that enlightens us, that tells us about the future, tells us where we came from, where we're going, the way of salvation, and our destiny as believers in Christ. And we thank you so much for your plan that you have for us. It's, it's a tremendous plan. And we look forward not only to the rest of our life here serving you, but for all eternity. And we pray that you'd be with us to this end. In Christ's name, amen. Well, I guess I'll leave that up. Thank you, Dr. Ice. I, there's a, a question that I, I think, um, and Julianne, I'm going to I'm going to change it just a little bit, kind of personalize it. Um, you've spent uh, the majority of your life well, studying? About 30 eschatology. years. About 30 years studying eschatology, which um, that's a lot of time. So it, in your... I've studied a few other things as well. Of course, of yeah. course. Mm -hmm. But in, in your... Um, 
Why? Why have you spent 30 years studying eschatology? That's, that's, a, that's, a bet, that's the easiest way I can put it. So essentially, you know, why is it important to you? Why? Well, because I almost converted to post-millennial preterism. Uh, I was involved in following the, what's called the Christian Reconstruction Movement. It's still out there. Gary North, Gary DeMar, uh, R.J. Rushduni, and a lot of those kind of people. And they believed in post-millennialism that the church was going to uh, bring in the kingdom, and they don't like that phrase, to advance the kingdom through the preaching of the gospel and a majority and eventually the entire world be saved and what's called theonomy. That is that the church is required to keep the Mosaic law except for the ceremonial part. And uh, therefore, that is the means through evangelism and keeping the Mosaic law, you know, the ethical side of things that, the, that we advance the kingdom and it comes in. So for about two days, I had decided to do that. And then it dawned on me if, if I did that, Israel would not be Israel because they believe the church has replaced Israel. And it, it caused me to, so I had read a lot of their material and it caused me to uh, start rethinking. And to make a long story short, they asked me to write an article in Bibliothea Sacra Dallas Seminary Journal about this, which I did. And uh, a professor at Dallas named Wayne House had me uh, write a book called Dominion Theology, Blessing or Curse. Uh, and I did, wrote that with him, and that got me into writing, and that got me into eschatology. So a wrong understanding of the end times could completely change how you live today. Yes, your view of the future impacts what you do today for, for Christians. Because if you're, if you're, if you're following a uh, dominion theology type thing, you're, you're pushing... Uh, a mosaic law, but you're also, I've, I've heard of some pushing, like, we need to take over the government. Right, kind that's of, exactly. And the make the whole mm -hmm. nation follow this mos the mosaic law. Right, and, and now, now they stuff. believe the Holy Spirit, uh, they believe you in evangelism, and as we step out and move forward, then we will show that the Lord, that we're ready, and God will give us victory. You know, see, but we're supposed to develop a uh, distinctly Christian worldview in every area of life, which I, I'm still interested in. Right. Right. But uh, I don't think that we're somehow going to uh, turn America into the new Israel or anything, you see. Right. Yeah. Okay, so why does uh, Revelation 22.11 tell, tell evildoers to keep doing evil? Why doesn't it say to repent? And so understanding on that. Well, I don't really know... Uh, I, I haven't really looked into that, but it sounds like he's saying that a person's destiny will be worked out in history. Uh, and so therefore, because you have, if we had spent more time going through the book of Revelation, you have the earth dwellers. Uh, I have an article in Bibliothea Sacra about the earth dwellers, about how none of them become believers. And that is a statement about uh, unbelief. And, and so history is demonstrating that an unbeliever is an unbeliever is an unbeliever. And yes, we don't know who's going to become a believer, so we preach the gospel to everybody. But in essence, it's saying no matter what an unbeliever, and I may be wrong on this uh, interpretation here, but... It's saying, in essence, an unbeliever, his basic problem is unbelief. Right. You know, and things. There's some questions back there. Go ahead. Revelation 24? Yeah, the one There is no Revelation 24. Oh, verse 24? 20 verse 4. Sorry. Okay, okay. Gotcha. <laughs> Sorry. So, uh, 20 verse 4. Um, so it was saying that, um, let's see, I saw the souls of those who are beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, um, that they had not worshipped the beast or the image, they didn't receive a mark on their foreheads, and that they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Can you skip down? And it says, this is the first resurrection. Um, to 
Well, I, I believe first resurrection there is a qualitative, not chronological emphasis. In other words, and he's saying this is the, the resurrection of believers. But I'm not sure exactly what you're asking. Yeah, he, he's simply saying that they're going to be, re they're part of the first resurrection. The believer's resurrection is, is what I understand. Resurrection is something that takes place uh, Okay. The resurrection of church age believers happens at the rapture. So that's part of the first resurrection, so to speak. That you have uh, then because it's focused in the book of Revelation on the tribulation from chapters 4 through 19. And in a sense, I think it's telling us what happens to those people that were killed uh, who are believers for their faith. And he's saying they're going to be resurrected and they're going to reign and rule with Christ. That's how I understand that. Mm-hmm. Uh, probably not stake, because that came uh, after the flood. Go vegetarian. So, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I, I agree. There'll I agree. There'll still be steak sauce, maybe. So. <laughs> <laughs> but you will have a new body, and you will think different, and a new mind. You're going to love fruit. <laughs> Yes. Okay. Uh, the Bema judgment is a term that's used in First Corinthians, uh, and it was a reference to uh, the Greek cities where you would go to bring your issues uh, before the city authorities. And so Paul apparently took that to say that we're going to all appear before the beam of judgment as believers and we're going to be either rewarded or uh, lack of rewards uh, at the bema, and that's going to take place after the rapture in heaven where we are evaluated and it says it's required of a steward that he be found faithful. So we're going to be evaluated as to our faithfulness and rewards are going to be given. There's five different crowns that people put. Go ahead. It, it's based on works performance is my understanding. Sure, I've been there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, th that would be a precise application of the use of Bema in the past. But my reading and study is that uh, what I just said earlier, is a g it's a general uh, place where people came, and it may be that the Romans used it in that way, but it was a place where uh, if you were a member of a city, you got your... You know, you went to court, your justice, and, and those kinds of things. Right. Sure. Past uh, your life, I assume. You know, and this is a future judgment, so it'll be what happened in your life in the past. Yeah, that's fine. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, John. All right. Uh, 
uh, it's a yeah I mean it depends uh, 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 it's important because it's at least a third of the Bible almost and you cannot as I said it in my first lecture you cannot interpret the Bible without interpreting uh, these views unless you're talking about the book of Ecclesi not Ecclesi Ecclesiastes or Proverbs I think Proverbs has 1% prophecy in it you know uh, and things like that, but uh, y you you can't develop a biblical or Christian theology without having an eschatology. And uh, I think it uh, is it a hill to die on. Depends on the the situation you're in. If a local church, I I think it would be very hard uh, because a local church gives a statement that they believe certain things, and I would not hire a staff person who doesn't think are in agreement with the doctrinal statement but in other relationships with other people you know you can have different views obviously and interact and it depends on what you're doing together if you're working you know in some Christian political organization you can you know it does matter your your logic but it doesn't matter if you all come together to do a particular cause or something like that so, uh, I, you know, our, our school, because of our doctrinal statement, only hires people who are premillennial, for example, and pre-trib even, real narrow. Thank you. Um, uh, quick statement, just so you know, I know you didn't quite make it to calculus. Jared uh, Miller <laughs> thinks that he's done the math right, uh, but he does start out, he says, I'm bad at math. So I could be wrong, but to have two inches of gold in front of the Sabre building on top of the existing pavement, it cost uh, uh, $5,913,600,000. Just FYI, so come, you guys know. Come, come to Calvary and walk on streets of gold, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that's a lot. It's, just that's just that parking lot that's not the main parking lot. Either. It would almost bankrupt. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, guys. Let's give it up for Dr. Ice one more time.